Hello, friends, and welcome to Impact Everywhere, a podcast that searches for people having a positive impact in unexpected places. My name is Benjamin Von Wong, and for this first episode, I'm excited to introduce Joe O'Connell, the founder and president of Creative Machines, a design and fabrication firm located in Tucson, Arizona, with a mind-boggling 77,000 square foot of space, where they build massive public art installations, museum exhibits, art for children's hospitals, and even products for disaster relief, just to name a few. On paper, Joe isn't technically an activist. He doesn't directly campaign for social or political change, yet everything that he creates is designed to bring people together and inspire self-confidence. And that, to me, is impact. Although some of you might find his journey a little unrelatable. After all, how many of us get to play with melting lead as a child? I encourage you to read between the lines to see how he weaves impact into everything that he does. The three things in particular that I noticed? First, that impact can only happen after you have a clear vision of why you're trying to have impact in the first place. Second, that the best way to measure the impact of art is to start with a measurable environment. And third, if you want to get involved in the impact space, make sure to position yourself as a solution to a problem. All right, that's it for the summary. Here's the interview. Joe, tell me, how did you get started? Just really quickly, it's been about 30, 40 years of playing around in the space. I'd love to get a sense of how you went from being one guy with an idea to a company now of over 30 employees here in Tucson with 77,000 square feet of property? The first community is always the family, for better or worse. And my parents were remarkably open. They have the maker gene in spades. So they gave my sisters and I workbenches when we were kids. We didn't have a whole lot of money, but they were teachers, so they had time. And instead of buying us Legos, we would basically make our own toys as youngsters. And it took until I was in college and started, you know, looking to wider communities before I realized how unique my upbringing had been. A lot of those seeds were planted early on, tolerance for risk. And like some of the experiments I did with like boiling lead and throwing stars, landing on the roof and projectiles and crazy explosions I shudder to think, but they just raised an eyebrow and let it continue. I went to four different universities and really did my best to try to find community in academia. And while I think it's probably better now, it was a little challenging at the time. When you were smart before the maker movement, but you liked working with your hands, they'd say, oh, no, that's that's for the, you know, the dirty, sweaty people. You want to go into academia or maybe join a think tank or... Uh, do research. But for some reason, I always wanted to make the things that could build the community that I'd known as a child and wanted to see as an adult. So to make a long story short, after working for a few companies that created museum exhibits and other permanent outdoor installations in the early 90s, I founded Creative Machines in 1995. And in a mission statement that was wildly optimistic at the time, I came up with, we create objects and environments that encourage creativity, support social interaction, and inspire self-confidence. And every statement there is wildly optimistic. There was no we, it was just me in my garage, and the table saw left off right over the washing machine. So some days I had to choose between clean laundry and making. You know, the only work I really had was doing small interactive exhibits for science museums, but I didn't think of it as just a exhibit company. And it was all about creativity, social interaction, and individual self-confidence. And I think you need all three of those together. So creating the installations that you do requires a lot of money and time and energy. And you have this kind of chicken and egg problem as a creative, generally speaking. Like you want to get paid, you want to receive the funding to do the creative thing. And so how did you navigate that, especially in the earlier days as you were trying to build up your company from garage man to, you know, to the, to the first employee? Well, there's different paths that companies follow and you have to get work and I think the biggest obstacle to any company is cash flow and so I would take jobs for science museums and during those years science museums were reasonably well funded by the NSF and by local municipalities and they were growing so I was able to organically grow from one person to three to five and we reached a stable point around eight where I was heavily involved in every project for about the first decade but Almost by accident or by insight, I was always interested 
in expanding to new markets. And I'll say this, that we were mission-driven, not market-driven. A lot of companies that we were competing with or collaborating with wanted to be the best exhibit company. We wanted to be the best objects and environments that support confidence uh, and social interaction. So early on, I got interested in, you know, I saw kids in children's hospitals, and I was like, you know, there's a lot of parents who are already doing good things for their kids, and they bring them to children's museums, but there's a whole unserved audience in children's hospitals. So we started reaching out to children's hospitals. I got really interested in art, and so we started doing public art projects initially at a loss, but we always had to have that business going in the background, and for the longest time, it was um, finding a market that would support the mission. And you can jump from one market to the next to the next, and you almost want to look at the natural world. The, the gene lines that are most successful throughout history are not only the ones that are fittest for their individual environment, but they're constantly evolving side subspecies that can then be poised to take advantage when the environment changes. You know, just for an example, when the economic crash hit in 2008, 2009, just about every museum job that we had under contract or about to go to contract just completely disappeared. And it was fortunate that we'd already made forays into public art and into art for healthcare, which was driven not by business interests, but by just my own personal interest that, hey, this is a great place for our expertise and where we want to go. And so suddenly those markets opened up for us. So, so walk me through your mission really quickly, because if you play in the public art space, that means that you're contending against public facilities. You're competing against funding for schools, for roads, for you know the basic necessities. How do you, how do you see the value of art in community and how are you conveying that to different people? Well, I think there's actually good evidence just below the surface in almost every area that we operate. So when we were starting to get into the children's hospital region, we did some research on what are the measurable healing benefits of art. And we found some research at the time that assigned real numerical data derived from you know, measurable things like T-cell count, number of days required on certain antibiotics before measurable levels of fever decreased, you know, real numerical measures of healing. And a lot of published research was starting to show that the type of activities that we recommended, which is long, immersive, losing yourself in creation, like creating a building out of building parts bigger than yourself, or putting on a play in a playroom with other long-term residents of the hospital, or figuring something out that's long and complex, that type of immersive play actually yields those measurable health outcomes. Measurable not only in healing for the children in the hospital, but measurable in economic terms for the hospital. Because in a given 10 days, if a hospital can cure one child in five and then put a second child in that bed for the second five, they actually make more money than if one kid spends... 10 days in the hospital. So we would say, you know, this might cost you $500,000 to start, and then you'd need an annual budget of 100000 or whatever. And that sounds like a lot of money, but if you compare it to an MRI or another new piece of diagnostic equipment that also bears measurable results, it's, it's on a par. So then would you say that the easiest people to convince are the ones that are already looking? So for example, if mm-hmm. a a city already believes that if there was more art, it would attract a greater number of tourists. And so there's like a measurable direct connection. Um, however, if they're not looking, you s- it's really hard to convince them. Is that the case? With cities, it's a little easier because they have examples they can look to. So for instance, we were commissioned by the city of Houston to create a tra- an attraction right in the center of their downtown. And they looked at Chicago and Anish Kapoor's Cloudgate you know, colloquially called the bean, they said, we deserve a bean. We're going to be a bigger city than Chicago in a few years. We're number four, they're number three. We need something like that. And of course, the budget they had was just a fraction of the bean, but we got it. And a lot of the experiences we create are not just to create an Instagrammable moment, but to help people feel connected to their city, to feel some connection between the personal scale and the monumental scale. And that's It's both tricky to do and easy to do in these permanent installations we do. But the making the argument is easier because they've seen it. 
We've seen it in architecture. We call it the Bilbao effect after, you know, the, the Bilbao Museum by Frank Gehry. But I think actually on a smaller scale, the argument is also made by looking to beautiful cities around the world and the placemaking movement. So you look to European cities and the beauty and the common spaces in the public squares scattered throughout the cities leads to both tourism and high quality of life within the city. And although people have tried, and I'm sure there are good efforts to make direct economic equations relating the placemaking objects to economic outcomes, it doesn't seem like we have to do that. People get it. People in city government get it. But, but what about you as an artist then? Like, you've done so many installations now, maybe hundreds. What makes an installation successful? How do you know when you've touched the community in the right way? How do you know when they resonate with it? It's, if Instagram photos is not your metric, then do you have one? Do you just stare at people? Do you ask them <laughs> questions? Do you wait? Is it the reviews that come in? Is it, is it something else? The stuff we do is usually funded by taxpayer dollars. If the people don't really like it, we have failed. And I I like that radical democracy because it keeps you honest. I started my career in science museums by actually spending a whole lot of time out on the floor watching people really use the exhibits we were designing. And I would run back into the office and I'd say, hey, this is amazing. You have to see it. They're not using things in the way we intended. Sometimes it's better. Sometimes it's worse. But it's completely different. And a lot of the other designers are like, oh, I'm too busy designing the next set. I I don't really want to go see how people are using it. We actually do spend a lot of time watching how people use and interact with our pieces. And some of the things I look for are when a stranger will approach another stranger in the presence of the art and point something out. So, for instance, one of the pieces we did has a secret button. It's a bolt that you can touch to change the color programming of it. And I just love it when I'll go into the space and no one knows that I'm the artist behind it. And a complete stranger will say, hey, I want to show you something. And I count that as a positive thing. I don't know exactly how to measure that numerically. When people take Instagram photos or post in various other social media forums, they typically accompany what they're photographing with an explanation of what it means to them. And I think there's ways to tease out from that that this has actually been a positive catalyst for social interaction and their own feeling about themselves and about their city. It's worth mentioning that some of the most successful public art has taken on a life beyond how it was originally created. And it really is, it's a collaboration between the artist and the community. So, you know, the Statue of Liberty, uh, the Eiffel Tower were not necessarily intended to have their permanent resting places where they are. And, you know, the Statue of Liberty was initially met with some indifference in America. And there was this leftover island. Where are we going to put this thing? You know, you had an ambitious sculptor who wanted to make what at the time was the largest figurative sculpture. You had a temporarily disgraced faction of French government that wanted to snub their nose at their own domestic government that was in power and wanted to commission a sculpture related to the concept of liberty and who else would they give it to but America. So you had all of these political forces and accidents coming together to form what is now a coherent story about welcoming immigration, but that wasn't the original intent. And I love it when works that we create take on a life of their own. For instance, a piece we did in the central urban core of Calgary, which creates a, an oculus where you can see the sky and it blocks out the hard-edged uh, urban landscape around it, has become a really cool meeting place. It's near a bar and a ballet school. So there's like dancing into the night. You can rest your cell phone on a ledge and completely drive the interactive lighting of the piece. And so people have created their own rituals that they post on YouTube. There's this lumberjack song which is really popular, and they'll, people will film themselves dancing around inside the sculpture and playing the lumberjack song, which then drives the lighting of the sculpture. And so when people develop rituals around the pieces we do, we know we have succeeded in our mission to form, to supply a catalyst where people are supplying the other half of it. It sounds like your metric is to look at these engagements and to better understand them, to see if you've catalyzed any form of novel interaction that has never existed prior. It's not an individual thing. Ideally, it's a gathering of now two or three or four more people. It's something that people will kind of connect with or kind of associate personal identity with. Are the metrics that you use to judge a successful project the same as that by the clients that hire you? Are they looking for the same things? Or do you find yourself sometimes at odds with them 
in terms of what they're actually gunning for. I think we're both on the same page. We may use different language. Let me give a few examples. One of the first things I noticed in observing exhibits and art in public is that the fundamental unit by which people come to objects in public is typically not the individual. It's not one person walking up to something. It's typically groups of two, three, four, a family, a couple, three friends out. It's almost like the fundamental unit of human interaction is the small group. And yet I often find the metrics that the people commissioning us, whether it's for an interactive exhibit or for an art piece, are framed in terms of an individual. And so there's a little bit of education, and I think just statistically, if you spent a lot of time in public just notating interactions, you would have that surplus of small group interaction. But we're after the same thing. One of the ways we judge success in what we're trying to do, and I think greater success for the municipalities, is the comments that people put in. If there's a really cool art piece, people will take a photo and post it to their Instagram feed, and they'll say something like, oh, isn't this thing cool? And there's not necessarily a reference to them or to, it doesn't change how they felt about themselves or their city. And there's plenty of art like that. And a lot of our clients, that's all they want. It's hashtag Houston, um, hashtag George R. Brown Convention Center, and then a photo of the sculpture. And that's fine. For us, success is a higher bar. We want the person to pose in front of the sculpture wings over water with their arms outstretched so that the giant wing above them looks like they have wings. So for, for us, success is really the object has been a catalyst for them individually or them and their friends to see themselves in a new way to bridge the gap between civic life and the monumental scale of buildings and civic architecture with the personal and the interpersonal. It's not just, oh, here's a photo of a cool thing and hey, I was here and I took it. It's me in the space transformed how I feel about myself and how you should feel about me. And I think there's a subtle distinction there. And typically people are only asking for the first, but when we show them that it's not just a cool object, but people are making a personal connection to it through their posts, then they get it. And that's what they want more of. By this point in the conversation, I was fascinated to hear how Joe's mind worked in judging the success of his projects. But as someone who falls a little closer onto the spectrum of activism, I wanted to hear more stories of state change, of how the presence of a piece of art might transform a community for the better. Of course, Joe had a couple stories that didn't disappoint. Another piece we did for a group of college students was really permission to come and hang out and give them an object that would respect their individual space. It was these little nested fish bodies that they could get into really close to each other. And that was permission to hang out with each other. Because when we first visited the campus, they were all in their dorm rooms, peeking out behind the curtains and, you know, chatting on Facebook. There was no nucleus, no object that they could go down to together. And it would give them an excuse to hang out and meet each other in person. So permission is a big thing that we're giving people in the work we do. And is that especially important in the world today? Do you feel like this is something that's becoming more and more important as we trend towards an increasingly digital society? Do you think that the future of public art is really about giving adults more permission to connect with one another? I think it, it's, it's permission to feel outside of the constraints you think you have to do. So part of it is permission to play like a child. Part of it, though, is other permissions. We need permission, all of us, to be human again and to escape the sacrifices we've had to make or thought we had to make to achieve certain comforts that we thought we had to have because we were told before we could really make a choice that we had to do. And how that broadly translates into art is some of the more recent pieces we're doing, which are not just for kids. For Alexandria, Virginia, we're making this playful outdoor structure you can get into. And as you look in the four compass directions, you're looking out through the sculpted faces of a um, planter and slave owner, a mother of a slave who's about to be shipped off, because Alexandria was one of the largest slave ports in the Union at, at the time of its founding, um, an abolitionist who's half crying, half living up to society's expectations, and a black slave. Without judgment, although I do think it's legitimate to judge these people, you're looking through the eyes of different people you standing in the center are at the point where you are making choices. 
And the whole idea is to give you permission to see the world through the constraints that every one of those four people had. Another piece we're doing for a city in Kentucky that recently removed its Civil War monuments is a colorful and playful pavilion that over the course of a year carves a new limestone, permanent limestone monument. And the first two are sculpted, uh, multiracial, gender-fluid, heroic young figures. And so it's hard to like make the jump from everyday life walking home from work to something that you may or may not believe in that we need or whatever. But it, the whole thing is human powered. It has this um, beat sequencer that it creates purely mechanically as you rotate this wheel and you can do it yourself. You can do it with friends. It's projecting patterns. It's just a really cool place to hang out. It's a social nucleus and it gives you permission to then be part of making the future. Right. So it sounds like you're really using art as this tool to bring people of diverse viewpoints together to spark new conversations, to maybe expand horizons. Right, and I think the thing that art can do, you know, I think we need everything. I think we need political action at the highest level. I think we need good writing. I think, I think we need to reform education. We need to reform agriculture. <laughs> it's all interconnected. Absolutely. Um, but one of the things art can do is to give people permission to rejoin the wider human experience that they maybe closed themselves off or their class and or the people around them shut doors earlier in their life. And they may find that some unjust practices that they have felt that they have an investment in, they didn't really. So that permission, I think, is actually quite profound. It's permission to see yourself as fully human, not just who society says you are. That's a tall order, but that's what we're working on in art. That's awesome. I mean, it, it all feels quite daunting. You're doing so many things at the same time. If we take it back to the listeners, and I think many artists want to do something meaningful. They want to give back to the community, but they're just str struggling to pay their own bills. How do you recommend they might make that transition? What would that look like? How do you get into a space where you really do care about giving back, but also need to worry about making money? How do you juggle that intersection? Do you have any words of wisdom to share? Well, yes. First, I would say if you are giving back to the community, there should be some monetary value. So let's look for a way that you can give back and get paid for it. And Getting paid for work is really a part of sustainability. If you're not going to get paid, you're going to get burned out. You can't afford it or whatever. You know, and I've had people, I've had artist friends say to me, oh, you do commercial work from time to time. I see your work is somehow tainted. And I'm like, you know, there's a reason Michelangelo went to work for the Medici family because it takes money to do this thing. We would never do anything evil, but we'll take work that pays the bills. But for particular projects, let's imagine that you are a listener and you want to do something really cool in the community and you have some inklings about what you want to create. The first thing I would say is don't try to do it yourself. Some of our most successful projects that directly impact communities are ones where we have been a little humble and we've joined forces with other people where we're the missing puzzle piece that we need that they need, but we're not the whole puzzle. So for instance, we um, we met up with this group Potters for Peace about a decade ago, and they they do a whole lot of work in northern Africa, Southeast Asia setting up these small manufacturing plants for point-of-use water filters. And they've already figured out the technology. They have a great group of volunteers that really know the local communities and the places they're going and can set that up. So it's less daunting. And we asked, well, how can we help you? And they said the huge issue we're having is we need to figure out a way to get a 20-ton hydraulic press to move these heavy aluminum molds together with 20 tons of force we need to get that into parts of the world that have inefficient infrastructure and corrupt customs officials. How could you help us with that? So we're like, oh, okay. We developed this 20-ton hydraulic press that can be serviced with almost no tools. The, the mechanism that moves the press parts up can be fixed with a clothesline. Anyway, yada, 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 yada. The whole thing disassembles and can be brought into a country in checked baggage. So by making this press that can separate into tiny little pieces and go and check baggage, we enabled them to start their operations in whole parts of the world that they couldn't have earlier. So the big takeaway for me is find someone else who's already doing something good. Don't think you have to like create the whole ecosystem and the cool thing from scratch. 
So find people who are already doing something and join forces with them. And then after some success in that area, you can take on more and more of it yourself, but start small and work up. Right, right, right. So I guess if I even read between the lines on what you're saying, I think many, many times creatives come up and they're like, I want to do X. And then they go around trying to sell this idea to different people and then they fail. And I think the critical difference in how what you were doing with Potters for Peace is you went in and you just listen. You're like, what are you working on? Let me better understand your problem. And from there, you actually proposed a solution. So you were trying to help them solve their problem through what, your knowledge of what you did. And you didn't go in saying like, I'm going to be a hero. This is what I want to do. I have this amazing, you know, mega press that I can design for you guys. And they, they just be like, well, we can't afford that or we're not interested in that, right? Yeah, you got to start with listening and then finding other people who are already, and, and there'll be a little, comp- little bit of compromise in working with other people, but it's worth it. And so then what we learned, because um, we've done like three or four generations of this press, and it's been deployed, and then they'll come back with feedback, and we've made small tweaks. And I guess if you could sum up what we learned from all that feedback is how to make it easy to field modify and field repair it. So we learned from that, and then, you know, probably five years after we started working on that project, we were approached by a different group that wanted to do emergency shelters for disaster relief. And so none of the actual literal parts from the Potters for Peace press transferred over, but the whole notion of what you want is not the really cool elliptical design that makes it into the design blogs. You want every pole to be the same length so that when it blows down in a windstorm, you know, they can put it back together really fast. You want easy field repairability with only one tool. And because the size of disaster camps grows and shrinks, you want units that can like snap onto each other and expand and contract at will. And so the second time around, the second project, we're able to bite off a little bit bigger part of the puzzle because we learned from our work with the first part. Right, and now the second part is probably going to lead to a third. And it's kind of like, it's that cascade kind of effect. But right. it, all, it all really starts with listening and that's such an integral part of what you do. I think we're out of time over here. If people want to see more of your work, if they want to learn more about it, maybe you can just tell us where they can check that out. Creativemachines.com. So we have presence on Instagram, all social media, and then our our website is really the the center of it. And look for our new website, which will be coming out in two months. That's um, got even more of the behind the scenes, the people who do the work at Creative Machines, more of the story, less of just the objects. So there you have it, guys. I'm curious to hear which parts of the conversation you found most interesting and what questions I should have asked that I didn't. Shoot me an email on hello at impacteverywhere.org. Next episode, we'll be interviewing Joshua Bellhumer, who runs a creative group called Brink. That's B-R-I-N-K. And He has some pretty interesting thoughts on a new generation of companies that are emerging, the role storytellers play in championing important causes, and why the internet is killing our humanity. If those topics sound at all interesting, make sure to subscribe, because impact is everywhere.